Okay. Hey, Belinda, how are you? Hey, I'm great. How are you? Good, good. Great to have you back from uh, overseas on your travels, and I'm excited to talk to you about it today. We've just got a, a siren going through, so you must have a, an ambulance. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. That's all right. No worries at all. So, peak, Belinda... Peak hour traffic, it's kind of normal. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, so, you've, you've been quite on quite an adventure. Um, just before you left, or around the time that you left Australia to go on your break overseas, you just put out a book. What was it called again? What was, it, what was the name of your book? The book is uh, Building Resilience in a Harsh World. Awesome. Okay. So in dealing with, I'm sure that would have been quite a process in writing that as well. And then you've taken a break. Yes. You've gone on a bit of a pilgrimage slash holiday to India with a mutual friend of ours and a bit of a tour. So I just yes. wanted today to ask you a little bit about it because I'm actually obviously in a situation where I've been doing long-term travel. And I'm trying to get my head around other people's experiences, either going on shorter term trips and also some long term stuff and how that differs from mine, because my experience is not the same as everybody else's. So mm. you ended up going to India. Had you been to other countries before? What sort of countries had you been to prior to that in other trips? Uh, I've actually been fairly mainstream travelling. I've been to the States a couple of times. I've been to Hawaii, obviously still part of America, but I've been to mainland America and, and to Hawaii. Um, UK, uh, I've been to Thailand a couple of times, uh, New Zealand, you know, that kind of thing. So nothing that's been to third world. Yep, yep. So this was your you, first... You know, many, even the parts of Thailand that I went to were fairly Western. Yeah, because you were in the more yeah. commercial areas where there was a lot of tourists, I presume, in yeah, Thailand? Correct. Yeah, I'd been to Bangkok and parts of, you know, around there, and then I'd also been to, uh, to Phuket, so, yeah. you know. And yeah. how long was your trip to India? I went for a whole month. Wow. Um, the original plan was to do, I know, right? Um, the original plan was three weeks on the actual formal tour, Mm -hmm. And then I was having an extra week in Delhi where I was going to do my, my formal book launch. It's available on Kindle now, but it's not. Um, anyway, long story short, that didn't happen. But ended up going to see some other parts of India that I didn't even know existed and certainly weren't on the first part of the tour. So that was interesting in itself. Okay, cool. Uh, just out of curiosity, yeah. why do you say that? Those parts, without going into detail, those parts that you saw in that last week, was there stuff in there that you felt in that week that you were gl really glad that you saw or experienced over and above Absolutely. if you just stopped it at the third week? Was there quite a difference in that one week? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. We actually went to the Ganges. We went up to Rishikesh, up to where right. the Ganges first comes out of the Himalayas, or as they say, the Himalayas. Right. And uh, it was, uh, I mean, it's considered a holy place. And up there in Rishikesh, it's, it's the purest water you could find. And it was yeah. just extraordinary. You know how when you have a cold drink, like a, like a um, slushy or something like that, like an icy drink, and you get brain, brain freeze? freeze? You know how yeah. you sip it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, you know that feeling? Yeah. That's what happens to your feet when you stand in the Ganges. It's so cold. It yeah. is so cold. Like I only just stood in up to my ankles. An instant freeze. Like you yeah. feel it right through to your bones almost instantly. It's extraordinary. Yeah. But it was beautiful. It was really yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Because what I found in my trip, you know, for the last few years has been that when something goes wrong or something doesn't go as I planned and I end up somewhere different, it's the place that was something different that usually makes the most impact on me in some developmental, personal development, spiritual, spiritual, whatever you want to call it, way. It actually had the most impact. Yeah. And I think, thank goodness. Yeah. Thank goodness that it turned yes. out this way. Yeah. Yes. Because yeah. you can do your book. Um, a very dear friend. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. A a absolutely. Mm. Um, so a very dear friend said to me before I went away, Belinda, the, the best thing you could possibly learn before you go away is this phrase, it is what it is. Yeah. Because in India, nothing is what it seems to be. Yeah. <laughs> and you have to be prepared for a plan B 
B, C, D, E, and sometimes, you know, even further down the alphabet. So um, the fact that plan A isn't always what happens, there's always got to be an alternative, which is quite clearly what we went for. But um, I also think that India is one of those places that you don't go to without either expecting or even if you're not expecting it, then certainly having some kind of awakening of some sort. Mm -hmm. Something happens to people when they go to India. You can't experience all that stuff, you know, which I'm sure we'll talk about as time goes by, but you can't experience a whole pile of things in a third world country without expecting some kind of monumental shift. Yeah, Personally, okay. professionally, spiritually, very yeah. deeply. Mm-hmm. And I certainly did that. Certainly okay. did that. Okay, so... And it started from when I arrived, I have okay, to say. Okay, I was just about to ask you. That was my question going to be, was that how was your reactions, like when you first stepped off the plane, you know, the first 24 hours, did... Did that change? Did you initially think, oh, my goodness, blah, 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 positive or negative, and then a week later or two weeks later go, actually, that's different, you know, actually now I see it differently now that I've settled in here in some way or another, or did it stay constant throughout for you? How you felt? Okay, so what happened to me was I'm a bit of a workaholic, So for me, a holiday has to be away from home. Yeah. Otherwise, I just keep finding things to do. So for me, once a year, go away and then I'm on holidays. But what I discovered in India is because it is so different from anywhere I've been before and so different from anything here, of course, uh, that I was living so fully present. Mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking about at home. I wasn't thinking about tomorrow. I was living in the right here, right now, what am I doing in this moment? And that allowed me to live every moment really very, very fully. Mm -hmm. I was totally present to what was going on in every moment. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, because when we're here, we have the ability, you know, we, we own stuff here and we do stuff here and we've got a job here that we need to perform in and, you know, all those other sorts of things where we have to be thinking about, well, if I haven't got the results today, I have to get the results tomorrow. Whereas when you're on holiday and you're fully immersed in what you're doing, that's all there is in that moment. In that moment, nothing else actually matters. And would you say then that, for example, based on, you know, comparing to previous holidays, that if you went to somewhere that was more similar to Australia, or potentially like America, for example, whose lifestyle was Mm -hmm. more similar that it didn't, for want of a better word, stress you as much or did not tax your resources as much in thinking. Therefore, you you didn't have to be in the moment quite so much to get through your day. Did you find that you disconnected from your life in Australia better and actually gave your brain a break from the world of Australia more in India because you just simply didn't get time to think about it? Or was it just different? It was just different. For me, it was just different. Like um, the last holiday I took was in, in, was in Hawaii. Yeah. And, uh, you know, whenever I leave Australian shores, I always just live in the moment because that's what I'm going for. I actually yeah. deliberately go away in order not to think about what's happening here. But because it's similar and they speak the same language and, you know, eat similar foods and all that kind of stuff, it, it's, it is a bit same, same, even though you're in a different country and you're experiencing it slightly different culture yeah whereas in india everything's different yeah you know the the language is different the food's different the accommodations are different the landscape's different everything is just different yeah and I'm, different doesn't mean good or bad different is just oh, different that's just different and that's the reason i chose india was to have a culturally different experience you know i've, I've been there done that with western kind of stuff you think know? Okay, well, whatever. Yeah. Um, but I, it, I was ready to immerse into something that I had never, ever experienced before. That's part of the reason I chose India. And so when you got off the plane and, and you said that it kind of started right from straight away, what were the things that you noticed 
straight away or, or when did you start to become aware that actually this is shifting me in some way? This is, is developing and changing and awakening me in some way. And what sort of things were happening for you? I think I became aware fairly quickly because uh, like the first two nights I flew Brisbane, Singapore, Singapore, Mumbai, which used to be the old Bombay. And we were two nights in Mumbai and uh, there's some big street markets there that are on, you know, every day, every night sort of thing. And I just started to observe even the people who were considered to be, you know, the paupers or the beggars or the whatever else. And I'm going, you know, that some of them are actually really very clever. There's a guy that has, for example, no legs. But either he built or someone built for him a platform with wheels on it so he could scoot himself around the place. Now, that to me is just genius. Yeah. yeah. So he's, although he's got no legs, he can still get around and do what he needs to do. Yeah. There was a guy who clearly had very little. He was dressed very basically and, and sat on, you know, a small mat on the marketplace and he had some bathroom scales in front of him. That's what he did for a job. Yeah. You know, he, people people like me would go and give him, you know, 50 rupees or something, which is about a buck. Yeah. He'd stand on his scales and say, hey, madam, you weigh way too much, get off. You know? <laughs> <laughs> sure. But, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know you're joking. But, you know, that, I think because of their situations, they found more creative ways to, sorry, to, to do things that um, I think people in the West would think were beneath them. Mm. I don't know if that's judgmental. Yeah. Maybe it is, yeah. maybe it isn't. But I just thought that people who had very little were quite creative in how they were able to actually create some kind of income for themselves. So um, they're better at creating earning income from very simplistic things rather than getting completely complicated about it all. Don't get too confused. Yeah, don't get too confusing about it. Do you, you know, and then of course sorry. there's the, oh, sorry, I was just going to say, then there's the, the um, young women with babies on their hips who knock on the, knock on the window of your cab while you're at the traffic lights begging, you know, and they're going like there's food for me and food for the baby and whatever. And the kid's sitting there with a big smile on its face and bright eyes and all the rest of it. I'm going, their child is not starving. You know? <laughs> and and they, they seem to target, you know, we, I'll say grandmotherly types yeah. from the West because we're a sucker for a lady with a baby, you know, that kind of thing. And what happens is you give them some money, but they don't keep it. They go and give it to a bloke over on the footpath. Yeah, who takes it. So, you know, yeah. So I, and I guess that becomes their job. Their job is to target people like me and 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 get some money from them so they can feed the family. Yeah. That begging becomes their job. Yeah. So yeah. I, good, bad, or indifferent. There's no judgment on that. It's just the creative ways that they're coming up with doing whatever it is to put food in their mouth. But their and kids don't look starving. <laughs> and did you find, um, so obviously, uh, if it's similar to what it is in Europe, those people who are begging put on a misery face. They put on a sad face for you because they want you to feel sorry for them and, and provide. But in general, um, when you're away from that direct situation or in, in, in looking at the totality of the environment and the people that were in it, did you pick up an, a general feeling that they were depressed and miserable or were they still quite oh, no. comfortable and happy in their world or more joyous in their world than we are on average in Australia? How did you feel about that? You know, it's funny you should say that because I had this discussion with somebody just yesterday and as much as they have they seem to have a lot less than what we do as far as material possessions go. They are actually really happy people. Yeah. They're really happy people. So from the minute I got there, from day, day one to day 28, all I, all I met really were happy people. Yeah. Even the people who were on the streets doing it a little bit tough. And look, I, I'm not going to gloss over it. There are poor people there and, and there are genuine beggars who have nothing. They live on the streets and, yeah. you know, live under a plastic sheet of you know, whatever held up by a stick. Um, 
So you can either get hung up on that or, or just go, I, I, I get that that's what happens in other countries. Yeah. Um, did I feel bad about it? Um, I didn't feel bad about it, but um, I would have loved to have given them a meal or something like that. I don't, I don't know that money necessarily helps. That sort of thing. So, so I in that, don't have an answer. No, no, no. Of course not. Yeah. Um, so, in that though, when you're thinking about it from a broader perspective, if you're then giving them material possessions through the use of money, for example, so that then they could have, on a societal level, more material possessions, but they're perfectly happy without them, do you think you'd be doing them a favour or a disservice? I think you end up doing them a disservice because um, we have a mutual friend who helped a family over there quite a lot. Um, and what happened was because they didn't know how to handle money, they actually mishandled the gift yeah. and ended up in a worse situation than what they were in before. Um, so it's like, it's like when people here win lotto yes. and they don't know how to manage money, yeah. they end up spending all the and then lose what they had before. Same, you know same, but just uh, probably with less yeah, amounts. Totally get you. So when you, with that in mind, just staying on that point, because it's actually, actually a really interesting one to me. Um, mm. When, so you've gone away, and, and I don't know whether you were gone away long enough, but you've gone away for a month and you've been immersed in that culture and environment and seen their vibe regardless of their income. When you then came back into Brisbane, a more wealthy, comfortable thing. Did you notice a difference in the demeanour or the mental health state or the happiness level of Brisbane people compared to when you left? Did you suddenly come back and go, oh, I hadn't noticed, blah, 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 blah. Or did it feel the same to you or were you just relieved to get back into it? Interesting. There's about 20 questions in there. Um, <laughs> when, I, when I first drive, I, I actually came back and I was unwell. Mm -hmm. And I had been to see an Ayurvedic doctor over there. Uh, and I think I had my healing crisis there, which was a good thing. So I'm sure I would have been a whole lot sicker and possibly still unwell if I hadn't gone to see him. Um, but I did notice that um, people here are quite self-indulgent and I say this with absolute respect and there's no yep. judgment on it whatsoever I yep. but I, I, I have noticed that people here are quite self-indulgent with regard to this is what's afflicting me this week and regardless of whether you want to know about it or not I'm going to tell you mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm not sure whether I'm trying to think of how I used to handle things because I'm quite sure that I handle things a bit differently these days but I think um, I think people in the West, because we become isolated from our families and isolated from friends, we live alone or we, you know, once we're grown up, we leave the home and that's it, you kind of do your own thing. And I think, I actually think there's a lot of lonely people here. Mm -hmm. Whereas in India, even the poor people have somebody. Yeah. Even if it's more poor people, they still have somebody. So they're people rich. Yeah. They have relationships. Yeah. They might not have stuff, but have relationships. Whereas in the West, we have a pile of stuff, but we don't necessarily have the loving depth, um, closeness that you get with, you know, with the extended family unit. And, you know, even if you don't have family, the friends that you choose, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, and you notice so that I've just noticed being that, away for a month, you notice that difference. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But I also noticed that, um, that people who are deliriously happy over there, I had the great fortune of going to a couple of um, people's homes and spending a little bit of time with them and their families and kids and, uh, you know, parents and neighbours and neighbours' kids, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're just really joyful, joyful times. And, like, we don't do that unless we're having a party. Yes. And we invite some people over and, you know, have a good time and then it's everyone planned. goes home. It's 
planned and scheduled yes. well in advance. Yes, whereas over there it seemed to be a lot more um, just people would just turn up. Yeah. You know, with that, with that, what's the word? Just, just a spontaneous party. You know, you just, yeah, spontaneous. Just yeah. Yeah. And the kids would be sitting there dancing to all this Bollywood stuff and carrying on. It was just hilarious. And then, of course, they drag you up and, you know, <laughs> then you yeah. got to try and do it too. And it's so funny. And do you but, find, um, um, and would you, would that have happened as much? I know it does happen, especially once you've had a few drinks in Australia to get up and dance in the middle of a stranger's <laughs> party. Um, but did you see that more over there where people were just less inhibited in their expression of that joy? to be dancing in front of strangers and doing those sorts of things that we yes. might consider a bit yes. foolish or childish or... Yeah. Yes, definitely. But not only in their homes. Like, February is the month for weddings, apparently. Well, it is this year. It's quite auspicious. Apparently it was. Mm -hmm. So um, there was a lot of the little towns and, and cities that we went to where there were weddings and sometimes there were three or four in an afternoon and they would be traipsing down the main street with, you know, the guy on a horse going to the woman's house and, you know, all this kind of stuff. It's so loud. <laughs> They've got yeah. the boom boom music and the, everybody's laughing and cheering, carrying us so much colour and all those beautiful saris and all that sort of stuff. Um, and they just seem to be able to get into a vibe really quickly of joy. Yeah, just, that's interesting. And then everybody gets dragged into it. It's fabulous. And do you feel like, for example, if that was happening here, so your neighbours had parties every few days? Somebody would be ringing your cops going, can you tell these people to shut up? Shut up. Yeah. 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 You're, you're invading my space and, and my peace and quiet and my sense of decorum and, you know, whatever else. And, and um, uh, yeah. It, it, it was just so easy to get um, drawn into it over there and to want to participate because it was such a free flow of peaceful, harmonious, fun, joy, dancing, loud, noises, yeah. cheering, love, you know, all, all of those amazingly beautiful words that you can pile into an occasion. That's great. I, I certainly noticed and the reason I was very curious how you felt because that is certainly what I've experienced in Southern Europe. I can't, I spent most of my time in Southern Europe, not Northern Europe, so it's hard for me to, I can see the comparisons. I can see that it's not the same in Northern Europe, but I've spent most of my time in Southern. And I don't think they're anywhere near as extreme as what you're talking about in India. But I certainly noticed mm. the same. I mean, Spain and Italy are noisy places and you see holiday people who come over here going, we couldn't get any sleep. Our hotel's right on the, on the street and it's noise. Yeah. And, and you're going, yeah, yeah. yeah, you're in Spain. They're going to have a fiesta every second day down the street. That is, <laughs> that is what they do. And the walls are paper thin and you can hear everybody yeah. and the mummers calling at one another and the families and the whole thing. And you're going, oh, my God. So it's a bit of an assault on the senses. As I said, I think anything we're in it's New as India. But what I noticed when I came yeah. back to Australia for a short time was the complete disconnect with other people. The complete yes. disconnect in Australia where we all yeah. run into our houses, lock the doors, sit in quiet carriages, don't want to be disturbed, and there's no joy. There's no yeah. joy except for our space. planned events well in advance. And sometimes yeah. you have to contact people a lot in advance to organise a planned event and then people wonder whether if they've really got time, they bail out. You know, you have a party for 50 people and 20 show up at the last minute. And, yeah. you know, in India, yeah. I would imagine that it's the same as here. You would put out a word on five people and 100 turn up. Um, so <laughs> yeah, that's coming it. by and yeah, yeah. Something, just walked on in. And there's this spontaneous yeah. joy. And I, yes. I've never looked at statistics at it. It feels to me like they, I keep seeing wordings that people are struggling harder and that they say that their mental health and their depression rate is actually quite high in these very poor countries. But when I walk into them, mm. I go, by comparison with us, I don't see it. I don't see it. I see no. people who are very aware that they don't have the money. There is poverty around but I see far mm. more joy and happiness in their life 
Agree. What I see. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Okay. I couldn't agree more. And and India is much more poverty stricken than than exactly. where I am. So yeah, I'm curious. That's why I was yeah. curious to ask. Mm. Well, I don't I don't know how they count people in India, but apparently there's you know over a billion, 1.2 billion or something or other, 24 million live in Delhi, and you know that's the entire population of Australia living in one city, which is the same as London or New York or whatever else. I mean, it's not uncommon. Um, traffic is dreadful. Um, you know, Mr Modi, who's their Prime Minister these days, is doing wonders for helping with the clean-up. And, you know, apparently in, in Rajasthan these days, he said it's like you, every shopkeeper has to have a rubbish bin out the front of their store. Yep. It's fabulous. People are actually using it. Yeah, and, and I did notice I just done that it, it, it wasn't so dirty. But anyway, that wasn't really where we were planning it, um, where we were going. <laughs> there was a bit of an aside, really. But um, yeah, look, I, I just think that the people there, irrespective of whether they've got a lot or a little, their joy factor seems so much greater than ours. So, so with that, so. with that, and just to finish off this particular video, um, let me ask you this: now that you're back. Mm. Are you, have you seen ways or are you implementing ways or are you thinking, how can we bring this back to Australia? How can I bring it back for me? Or, or how can Australians change things on, on either front? Or is it like now that you're back, you've kind of dropped back into your normal routine and it's going to fade very quickly for you? Mm, good question. Um, I have tried to get back into my routine fairly quickly because I've, I've needed to for a number of reasons. Um, but that doesn't mean that I'm any less excited about the possibility of going somewhere in, in the next 12 months. You know, my plan is every 12 months go somewhere for a month. Um, whether it's the same experience or something different, then that's, I don't know. Um, Oh, look, there are people that I met that I will keep in contact with for the rest of my dying days, I think. Yeah. Um, I have a, a newly adopted uh, Indian brother and, and sister and family and so forth. So, you know, you, I, I go two days and then I talk to them because I just oh, miss them like you. crazy. And, you know, that, that it, it's, it's quite joyful for me to connect with them. And do you feel um, that that's allowing you to bring some people, of that joy yeah. home? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because if I happen not, if I've had an average day at work or whatever, I can just get on the Wi-Fi and go, "Hey, how are you going?" You know, FaceTime or, or you know, Messenger or something or other, and and just talk to them and go, "Hey, how's things?" And they're just so excited to be speaking. You know, it's yeah. just wonderful. We're and half so, away, it's just wonderful. The yeah. joy is just yeah. always there, and the love is always there. It's wonderful. Yeah. And so now that you're back with your established friends, for your mm. joy and to assist your own joy and to integrate that, you're still reaching back into almost strangers rather than reaching into your Australian community of great friends and wonderful people, as I'm sure that they are. Mm. You're mm. still finding that a better place to interact with that joy is with people you know far less. Because they have time, mm. and if, or they make time, yeah, which is just lovely. And I'm not saying that the people here wouldn't make time. If I rang any of my friends, I'm sure they'd be there in a heartbeat. But it's, um, you know, it, it, or oh, I'm getting dinner ready, or you know, I've got something on that day, or you know, or, it's more distracted, okay. and you're more probably aware of the the impingement on their time. Even if they don't say it, you're thinking, I oh, know they're really busy yes. and they've got to get this done, so I better not take up too much of their time. Yes. Um, yeah. 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 So so from what so I take from good. that, Belinda, is that, you know, there's a joyousness that comes just from being, just from being and existing and interacting mm. with other humans. And... Mm. As a Western society, the more that we kind of seem to have more possessions, have more wealth and possessions, the more we rely on those for our source of happiness. And it doesn't quite give the same 
thing. It doesn't bring the same level. And you, it's hard to continue that without those interactions. And we've got, definitely got this disconnect going mm. on, I feel, in Australia. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. The other thing that I noticed a lot over there is that not everybody has TVs. Mm -hmm. They have music systems, they have, you know, all sorts of other things. So they, they play a lot of music and so forth, but not everybody has a TV. And, you know, some people here in, in Australia, and I'm, you know, I know some people who go, no, I can't see you tonight because blah, blah's on TV. And it's like, are you kidding me? Mm. <laughs> yes, you, yeah. you know, you're not going to have a social interaction with another human being because your favourite shows on TV. Yeah. It's kind of sad. Isn't it? Isn't it? I found that I find that a lot. The reasons, you know, as you know, I was home for four months and I wanted mm. to try and catch up with friends, some of whom, you know, I knew really, really well and mm. thought we were close. Uh, and I feel that we're mm. close. And I still do. Like, don't get me wrong, I still do. But some of the reasons that I got given for why people couldn't see me, like, I'm tired tonight. I get tired on a Friday night. I need to yeah, rest. How and is I'm that going, an excuse? I'm about to leave the country. I don't know if I'll ever see you again. Yes. And you're tired tonight, I'm you know? Tired. I'm Sorry. tired. Yeah, I'm maybe tired. next time. Maybe next or time. Or not. When not, you know. Um, and, and, and once again, like we're both saying, it's not a judgmental thing. I think it's a societal expectation thing it's where as a society we well i'm just looking at where it we put as an observation yeah it's yeah, just same. an observation there's no judgment whatsoever on any of it you know yeah. everything i've said is just my observations is what I, I you know my comparison to what i have here or what i do here or what i see happening here as to what i saw and what i indulged in over there and you know like i said no judgment purely observation and, and isn't that interesting? I love that word. What that okay. needs to be. You know, yes. it, 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 the, it, you know, when you come at everything from a place of curiosity, then you can ask all sorts of questions. There's, there is no judgment. It's mm. just questions. And, and I, I just, I've just got to pick up on that, that use of that term because I see that as the ultimate irony. You said what I indulged myself in there. And we have this mm. perception that we live an indulgent life by comparison to a country like India. We have all the mod cons. We mm. can indulge all of these things in having mm. jet skis and our little toys to go play on and our holidays mm. and our wealth and our great food and our gourmet stuff. But what came out of your mouth was that you were indulging yourself in a country that has not got that yeah. on mass. Isn't that interesting? I indulge myself in the people and the food and the atmosphere and the, the, the loud bong, bong, bong noises and the, you know, the Muslim call to prayer at 5.30 in the morning and the uh, beautiful sounds of, you know, the bells chiming here and there. And, you know, it's to the smells of the incense and, and the colours. The, the colours, you know, everything. It was just, it was really indulgent. And to me, it was indulgent for all of my senses. Yeah, interesting. Mind, body, heart, spirit, all of it, everything was just, I felt like I just fully immersed in what I was doing. Living in the moment, fully, full immersion. Um, and I did feel like I was quite indulgent in doing that. It was fabulous. Absolutely amazing. One of the best All things right. I've ever done. That, that, that's so interesting. It's just so interesting. Um, I'm fascinated. Okay, well, we might just wrap it up there um, so that we don't, we don't talk too long and too hard. But I'd love to talk to you some more about some other things <laughs> another time if you have time, Belinda. That would be awesome. Fabulous. Yeah, yeah, of course. That would be lovely. All right, great. Thanks, Thanks Linda. Bye.